Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 149, Avenging Your Justice Squad. Some tips on how to run superhero RPGs that are fun for everyone. I'm Sean, and with me as always is the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, the RPG maitre d', answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Remember, we record live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. Now, this episode is sponsored by Crowd Games. Be sure to check out City of the Great Machine, a one-verse-many steampunk-themed board game with some really awesome-looking minis live on Kickstarter right now. Yeah, as of right now, it is day one, and they're already halfway funded. Now, it's been a rough week for me, so today I'm actually letting Sean take over most of the reins tonight and talk about his tips for running superhero RPGs. After that, we've got a review of Quacks of Quedlinburg, which we both played, and we wrap up with our weekend review where we talk about what we've been playing lately on Board Game Arena. Unless you actually had something in person. I didn't actually double check. Yeah. I know you've been super busy with work, too. Yeah. And I do have something that I'm going to show off the people in the penthouse who are still in the penthouse after the show. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We can't possibly read every co single comment on the show, but know that we do see them and appreciate you interacting as with us on all the various sites, socials, and more. We're going to start off with a comment from Phil Hatfield in regards to our topic of starting up a community gaming event. Good suggestions there, Mo. This is certainly helpful for those looking to get a game event going. Well, thanks, Phil. Uh, though I am a little concerned, we covered that topic a bit earlier than expected, the way things have been looking COVID-wise, but at least it's evergreen content, and it'll be there when people actually return to public play again. Well, we've got a follow-up comment from a couple of weeks back from Andras Libau, who talked about gathering data for Tapestry to better balance the factions. Now, that was the comment where I pointed out to anyone who does play Tapestry really should go to the Stonemeyer website after their play and log the results, and if possible, using the in-depth reporting tool. Because that's what Jamie's using to actually update the factions and try to keep the game as balanced as possible. Right. And the follow-up from Andra is, at Tabletop Bellhop, that is great. We logged the play with them as well. Awesome. I did really poorly with The <laughs> Chosen, even with the 60-point advantage and the militants won it in the end. Well, thanks for the follow-up, and I am so glad to hear that you're actually helping keep the game balanced. Now, I gotta say, in the games I've seen, the Chosen do seem really hard. Like, there's a reason they're getting 60 points, and it seems like a lot. You start the game, it's like, oh, I was playing the Chosen, look how far ahead he is, but then once you get into that third age, by then you're probably getting lapped. Um, this seems like one of the hardest of the factions to play. Now, I have seen people do better than others, I don't think I've seen a win, but I'm certain I've seen at least them played well enough to get second. So they're not completely out of balance, but maybe that 60 points isn't quite enough. And uh, I noticed you said the militants won it in the end. And uh, my first game, I played with the militants and I found them a pretty solid, even beginner mm -hmm. uh, faction to work with. Now, next up, a comment on our review of A Little Wordy that applies to the majority of videos we post on YouTube. Guksung write, An writes, Out of curiosity, what are you using to generate captions? Is there a reason you do not defer to YouTube's auto-generated caption? The auto-correct in your captions is slightly distracting, and the accuracy of your captions compared to YouTube's seems the same. Well, thanks for the comment. Um, part of it, I'm glad to hear that it's not, well, it is just me, I guess. It's not just web captioner. If uh, YouTube has the same problems. But the thing here that people probably don't realize who see our content on YouTube and don't follow everything we put out, which why wouldn't you? Come on, we're all over the place to be here live right now, is that we record the show um, here on Twitch. It's not recorded for YouTube. All of our content pretty much is live streamed here on Twitch first. And then Sean does some minimal ed editing, and then we upload segments of that content to YouTube which on a regular week would be the full podcast episode, the Ask the Bellhop segment of that podcast, and any reviews, each of separate videos. 
Now, the captioning you see on YouTube is actually generated during our Twitch stream. It's being generated right now while I'm talking. And we use a piece of free software called Web Captioner to generate it. Now, as for being distracting, I, I don't know what we can do about that. Like, I, where does YouTube put theirs? Like, is there a way we could put ours where theirs would be so people on YouTube are at least used to it being in the same place or something? Uh, theirs would probably be right over our name tags, I think. Okay. Uh, plus, wonder, it wouldn't maybe, be separate. Maybe put the captions down and put the name tags above the captions? Well, the other problem is it wouldn't be separate, right? YouTube captioning would just be one stream of captions for both of us together. Ah, uh, okay. Rather than the separate ones we have. That's another good point. So in a perfect world, the captions we generate for Twitch wouldn't actually be recorded in the yeah. same way the, our audio tracks are actually separate when we do a recording. Uh, the software we use does not have that option, so we would have to deprive our live viewers of captioning in order to have it not appear on YouTube. Now, that feature of uh, the separate recording is in the pipeline, but not available on this software at the moment. There's no way to do like a layer that's not recorded but broadcast they uh our old software obs uh streamlabs obs had that yeah, see, slobs. I was thinking that's what i still uh, use but so. apparently they used a real hack to do it um okay. and and the 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 keepers of obs of which streamlabs obs is a fork mm -hmm. of really don't like the way they did it and are finding okay. a proper way to do it so again it is in the okay. pipeline it's just not available just yet Sounds now good. next up Sticking with YouTube, we got this positive comment from Rayo Rusa on what our train, what it is a train game video. Interesting and fun. Detailed discussion, guys. Thanks much. Oh, you're welcome, Ray. I gotta say, I like that. That particular topic was a fun one to cover, and I, I think we made some good points in that one that I actually expected to get some hate mail on, but I'm, I'm glad to see people appreciate it. Well, finally, a comment from Kim Brebeck from Good Games Publishing on our Guildmaster review. As a publisher, I really appreciate your channel's eye for detail and the emphasis on who the game is for and isn't for. Great review. Thanks, Mo. Oh, you're welcome, Kim. Uh, this definitely sounds to me like we're on the right track for our reviews. Like, I do know our reviews are longer and more detailed than most podcast reviews. Actually, most podcast reviews... Uh, our one quick segment of we've been playing this and it's fun and here's a quick summary and that's about it um even the secret cabal is about the only other podcast that i listen to that goes into as much depth as we do and they only focus on one game a show because of it but i think it's worth it like i'm glad to hear at least the publishers appreciate it and i also know it has been fantastic working with good games publishing like they have been great on both sides of of the relationship and this is a relationship that's going to keep going because I just got shipping notification for a copy of Land versus Sea yesterday. So it's on its way here now. So you'll be hearing about more good games, publishing games in the future. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Tonight, I'm going to be answering the question, which is... So what are some tips you've learned for running superhero role-playing games after reading multiple core rule books? I don't even know what you're up to yet. And running a few superhero games. Well, a lot of the most important parts of running a supers campaign, I think even more so than in many other settings, are all done before the actual okay. game begins. This isn't just for the narrative games, but also for crunchier or tactical ones. Uh, the problem as I see it, or the benefit, is that superheroes mean so much to so many people. Mm -hmm. It could be Batman or Avengers or Daredevil or Guardians of the Galaxy. Right. Even within that, you could have Batman the Dark Knight or Batman 66, which are very different games. Mm -hmm. Now, while you could design this all in advance and present it to your players, here you go, this is what we're doing, it really benefits from a group discussion, an agreement among everyone as to the tone and scope of the game. Right. If you're playing D&D &D and going up against Strahd, that sets the tone pretty clearly to any D&D &D players. But in a supers game, you could be taking out thugs on a dock in one session and off battling demons on a different plane in the next. And depending on the system, most superhero RPGs are about making your own hero. 
and not just playing Batman or your favorite Avenger, but rather new heroes, either in an existing world or a totally new one. And over the years, running a few different superhero games myself, I've learned that different players expect very different things from a superhero game. They come in with their own expectations, and they often don't match. There's going to be people who love to be the guest writer for Spider-Man, while others are going to be like, I don't want to play a Marvel hero. Why are you, why are you limiting me? I want to play my own hero in my own world. Absolutely. Now, you may have set your tone, and you may have an idea about what sort of world you want to play in. But what about those characters? Now, this is something I've struggled with, and I hope I've learned some things through those struggles. First off, be willing to set limits. If you just decided on playing a street-level game, but one of your heroes wants to play Superman, it's okay to say no, especially as someone less familiar with running games like these. You can say things like, hey, I get what you're hoping for, but I don't think that fits in with what we're going to be playing as a group. But now, if you are saying no, have an option, a suggestion to help them as they may have put all of their time and thought up until that point into that one concept they had their heart set on. Something like, well, you know, I don't think a Kryptonian is going to be ideal for this game, but what about a ninja? You still get to be that fighting leader of the group, but the rest of the team don't have to worry about you knocking over buildings on them. Or perhaps let them be that Kryptonian. Let them be Superman and put them under the influence of, say, purple kryptonite, which you can look up. That does not have a defined uh, effect in the comic book universe yet. So you can get away with using purple kryptonite, which reduce soup's powers, but not remove them completely. And the entire campaign could be get Clark his powers back as the meta theme going on. Now, before you go on, I do want to clarify one thing for people who don't know a lot about superheroes. You talked about street level and different scales. What would you say are the scales that you have in most superhero games? Uh, I mean, your your basic uh, sort of edges are street level, which are your unpowered or very lightly powered, um, at most Olympic athlete sort of level people, people who put on a costume and want to help out their community. Okay. Or versus the galactic level heroes, the heroes who like uh, the Green Lantern Corps, who go out and don't just don't even focus just on one world, but actually save saving the universe from things. Right. And within that, you get uh, you know your your country level heroes. The Avengers are, are depending on what part of the Avengers are sort of country leveled to world leveled. Well, Avengers um, at one time were more local, right? You had the East Coast Avengers, yeah, East Coast and, the West, and West Coast, Coast Avengers, yeah, very, right? very, very much. Uh, whereas, you know, again, Spider Man is is that New York guy. New York, uh, he gets pulled yeah. out every once in a while, but really, his his turf is that whole New York uh, vibe. Uh, or Daredevil, like, is another great street level hero who just hangs out in those certain areas unless he's pulled out by some you know grand event. Um, and right. that's and that's a lot of the leveling. It's 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 that galactic to local neighborhood. There. Now, aside from just the general balance, certain powers or power sets you need to think about carefully. Now, knowing your group can go a long way into helping making these decisions. If you are playing with a new group, however, it might be best to outright ban certain powers up front to avoid issues. Psychic powers, I have discovered through my own mistakes, can be especially troublesome as they can often utterly imbalance any plans you may have with just a simple action. Now, aside from specific issues like psychics, don't be overly restrictive. When someone asks if they can have power X, your instinct might be right away say no. But take some time and think about it. There's almost nothing that villains can't counteract, and every good super should have a weakness that helps balance out their powers. You may be easily you may easily be able to balance out that crazy character with a fun quirk or weakness that adds a fun twist to the game, or have a villain who knows exactly what to do against that hero, but struggles against one of the other heroes that some might perceive as the weakest. Now remember, as the GM or editor, the only limits are your imagination. There's not much, if anything, that hasn't already been done in one comic or another. 
Now, speaking of powers and power selection and limiting them or not, another thing that's going to greatly affect your decisions about this is what game you're playing. Well, I haven't read nearly as many superhero RPGs as you have. I know the handling of powers ranges from calculus level math equations to figure out just how much you can punch or how fast you can go to completely narrative based powers like super speed and everything in between. Very true. So some games with defined power sets may mechanically limit what a player is able to do. You may not be able to pick the power that you have in your mind because it doesn't exist in that game. It's never been made. Um, and as a GM, you or, or even as a player, you may not have the system knowledge to be able to go in and, like in D&D, write your own spell. Or, in this case, your own power. While others, like masks, for instance, leave only the imagination as the limit on your powers. Whatever you want can be a power, and the narrative drives everything else. Now, because of some of this wild variance, this brings us to something that I cannot imagine skipping on a supers game, your session zero. So the openness of a supers world and the varieties of powers and tones available mean that it is really easy to go down a rabbit hole in directions that might concern some people. Peril and danger are part of what make comics fun for some people, but the adjacency to reality is much greater than when you're playing a centaur running your sword through slime. Fair. We can, and often these days do, connect with superheroes in a very human way. It's not to say that you can't connect with your fantasy characters, but superheroes are something that for many more are real, are more real. And then what this means is that your actions as a GM, or for me, I, I prefer to use the term editor for superhero games, may be able to impact your players much closer to home. Now, there's equally a chance that all your players are down for whatever and encourage you to go wild, and that's great. But finding that out is what the Session Zero is for. Mm -hmm. To figure out as a group, because maybe Aaron is fine with being tied up in a villain's death trap, but doesn't want you to fridge their partner for a cheap plot point. Find that sort of thing out before you get there. So this is one of those things that I honestly think is true of every role-playing game, just potentially more so for supers, is set expectation. I was actually just a guest on another podcast where we were talking about Dungeons and Dragons, and my biggest RPG advice to every group is set expectations and revisit those expectations from time to time. It doesn't have to just be session zero. You can have a 0 0.1 sessions three sessions in to make sure everything's working out. Huge advice here that it applies to every RPG. Now, looking at supers specifically, what is the stuff that you think needs to be covered in a session zero? Like like the power levels we've already kind of mentioned, your players know each other, How? what's the scope? What kind of things would you like insist need to be in a session zero? Uh, well, again, tone is, is that number one thing. You cannot uh, avoid tone. The difference between, you know, your your bat, your bat your Silver Age uh, mm -hmm. or your Batman 66 campy versus your Batman Dark Knight where superheroes kill people um, is, is a huge deal. Uh, and, and it can be a deal breaker for a lot of people. So in a supers game, you often can't separate character creation from the safety aspects of Session Zero. Ideally, this will all be handled together as one cohesive flowing or flowing together online. For me, the meat of session zero is player comfort. You don't want to have one player willing to do anything to stop the bad guys, including shooting innocents, while the rest of the team is looking for more friendly, upbeat, campy style adventures. Power level, for instance, is something that should generally be presented to the group especially for the newer gym. That's presented to the group, not discussed. <laughs> you want to work in a range that you're comfortable with and not let perhaps more advanced gamers push you out of your comfort zone until you're ready. When it comes to things like playing as a team versus solo heroes, that's very situational. Many games simply begin assuming that you are a team. But... I personally have got no real problem in my games letting them all start as completely unrelated solo heroes 
And I enjoy the challenge of getting them together to form that team and, and figuring out what it's going to take to get this person in, in, in touch with this person throughout the adventures. But that's a very personal choice, and some may not relish that challenge. For them, I say, go ahead. As, a, as, as God and your world say, you guys are all going to start on the same team yep. and just work from that. Really, though, again, Session Zero is all about making sure everyone is on the same page and in agreement for tone and content. You don't want one player thinking Richard Donner while the other one is thinking Zack Snyder. And on top of everything else, use your lines and veils. Check out our episodes about safety for that. Or other people who have discussed it much better than the two old white Very guys true. have. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> Um, look at the, um, I'll, I'll plug uh, something here. I'll plug, uh, I wouldn't say friends of the show, but um, Shanna Germain wrote something called the RPG Consent Form. Uh, it's published under Monty Cook Publishing, who she works for. I would suggest checking out that document. That is a great session zero, sets up your lines and veils and expectations, at least as far as personal comfort and safety. Are. So, you know what, I'll even throw a link to that in the show mm -hmm. notes when I get to do them, which, you know what, I'm going to make a note here <laughs> in the show notes or I'm going to forget. Uh, I feel like I think I'll know what I'm talking about. Now, when you're running the game and describing things, it helps to think in comic book form, playing a comic book game. Panels, turns, or moments of action, pages, or a collection of actions leading up to a big turn at the top of your next page. Issues, usually thought of as sessions, depending on how long your group sits down to play. And don't be afraid to split huge scenes across multiple issues. Things rarely get wrapped up neatly in superhero adventures. Now, while superheroes are of course no longer limited purely to the paper of comic books, even the movies about them take inspiration from that source. While some, like a certain Hulk movie, may go way too far in that direction, they all generally pay, in some way, homage to their roots. There's just no reason- to rewatch re that, so <laughs> that, that's just amusing. There's no reason that you can't do that in your game as well. Panel 1. Page 1. A tall, humanoid lizard man in robes with gaudy jewelry stands in a floating metal pod over a sea of normal citizens, all being herded by less ornately dressed lizardmen carrying strange weapons that seem like guns. The floating lizardman is calling out, People of Arcadia, your surrender was wise. Okay. Heroes, you're all over here in this place when you hear about this invasion. How are you reacting? Nice. En encourage your players to think in panels too. A speedster may hit seven bad guys in a row in a single panel while your tank stands there absorbing a wash of incoming laser fire, screaming out his catchphrase while the others prepare behind him. So this one in particular, I generally agree almost 100% here because it emulates the genre, but it is definitely a personal preference thing. While describing things in terms of scenes and panels like the comic book fits the genre perfectly. And many games, uh, especially modern superhero games that I own behind me, have the rule that says a character can do an amount of things that can be shown in one panel of a comic book. That, that is like a very, it's a superhero RPG trope. I do know at least one group locally, which means there's probably others out there, that prefer to run their superhero games more like traditional RPGs, where they're actually taking on the role of the player, and they're not, no, no jump scenes, you're playing out every moment of the character's life, from going to the corner store to doing everything else, and it's all happening to them as characters, not from an outside perspective, reading the book or watching the movie. Now I find some of the crunchier systems are much more suitable to this style of play with things like action clocks or intervals so that the, the speedster gets to act 12 times before anyone else acts and other things to determine who acts and how much they can do. Oh, absolutely. It, there's so much personal preference in all of this. And it doesn't have to be as literal as my example. Or it could be your start and end of sessions are panel-like as order to set the scene and set up the end of the scene for what's coming next week. Now, this actually brings me to another point for the GM, and again, one that's universal for more than just supers. Use character names. It's a huge benefit to immersion when you can say, okay, Ultra, Master Laser has you cornered. How are you going to react? Versus, all right, Carlos, what are you doing next? <laughs> that goes for your alter egos, too. 
if they're not in costume, use their alter ego's name. Talk about Clark, not about Superman, not their player name, and encourage the players within the group to do this as well. Now, when the session is over, leave a cliffhanger. It could be as bold as the day suddenly turning into night, or as embarrassing as someone they know walking in on them in costume, but leave a cliffhanger. As long as you're not running a single session. Generally, you want a demo, denouement and wrap up at the end. Ongoing campaign, I definitely agree with this. Though maybe not, maybe throw in like a, a different style of cliffhanger where a new and present danger shows up at the very end, maybe to encourage you to sign up for your next con game. But I wouldn't say do a cliffhanger every time. You want in a single session, you want that sense of closure. You want them to have completed and finished the thing. Maybe present them with something new. So I, I have a, I, I actually will say for me personally, go with a cliffhanger anyway. But what you can do in the case of, uh, of a con game, for instance, is you do that wrap up and then you throw in that after credits cliffhanger. Yeah. You know, you, 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 you get people settled and then you, you leave them a hook, just something that they can talk about when they're walking away from the table, when they're going off and, and sitting around at lunch at the, at the con, mm -hmm. give them something to talk about. And that's the sort of hook you can throw in for the one shots versus your campaign games where, you know, all of a sudden everything goes wrong. See, to me, that's more of a hook than a cliffhanger, where a cliffhanger is something's about to happen to these characters again, whereas a hook's more like stay tuned for the next story. Right. Maybe yeah. we're just talking terminology. Yeah, fair enough. Now, don't forget that even in a solo book like Spider-Man, share the wealth with other people. Maybe one session was pretty focused, heavily focused on Aaron's character, and issue two will be about Amy's character. And issue three is all about finding a lost alien NPC where the party works pretty equally throughout. Spread the wealth. All your characters are heroes. Give them all a chance to shine and show what they're capable of. And this advice, of course, is not limited to just superhero RPGs. Carrying the spotlight is a big part of any good role-playing game session. Absolutely. So another thing is don't get bogged down. Now, again, this is going to be a little group uh, dependent. Uh, some groups may want to go this way, and some DMs might. But try to think about your, your dungeon party. You could spend sessions wandering around the city or sitting in a tavern, and they just need that push to get them to finally go out and get in the darn dungeon. This will happen in your Supers games as well. Are you playing masks for an emotional voyage of teenagers? One of them gets a call in the middle of their blathering and it's all broke and they get broken up with by their significant other. Are you playing uh, mutants and masterminds for a big smackdown battle? Well, all of a sudden a thunderous sound is heard and alarms bla blare across the city. Are you playing prowlers and paragons and you want something a little dark night edgy? The power is cut to a wealthy area of town and the villains go wild. Or maybe you're base cr dungeon crawling in base raiders. You find a map to a new location you thought was only a myth. Pacing, pacing of course, is, is a matter of group preference, though I think almost all modern RPGs um, push towards the jump cuts, right? Get to the action as quick as you can. And I honestly think with supers, you want to do that. At, you want to get to the drama or the action, whatever it is. If it's the melodrama of, oh my God, Aunt May fell down the stairs while I'm battling Doc Ock and I don't know what to do. Or it's the battle of boom, all of a sudden a spaceship appears in the sky. You want high energy, not a plodding, wandering pace for a supers game. Absolutely. So as part of this, don't overthink or over plan have planned opponents, but use your group for inspiration. If you're playing a supers game, you're probably all fans to some degree. Even if you're not playing a narrative games like masks, there's no reason you can't get your characters to contribute in various ways, such as everybody name three contacts in the city that you rely on for information. Uh, what relatives do you have in the city or people similar to relatives, if you're an only child, that comfort you the way a family would. Uh, who's your biggest enemy, both in alter ego or in, as a super? And what is the thing that you, your character, what as a superhero fear the most? 
A few simple questions like that can give you more plot material than you will likely use in a reasonable time. Mm -hmm. And as you play, more and more things will be revealed, relationships will evolve. You never know when the throwaway villain you added as a distraction turns into the arch nemesis of one of your characters and will keep coming back for the rest of the campaign. Uh, sourcing the table. That That is the thing that I wish we knew about back when we were early role players, right? Back in the, the early, the, the late 80s, early 90s. Oh man, that 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 is something I, I just wish was more of a thing. Because not only does it bur- remove the burden from the GM, it gives the GM inspiration, and it also gives the players ownership of the world. They created it. It's their character and their city and those are my contacts that I came up with. Not the DM said, yeah, your aunt is suddenly in trouble. Like, oh, I have an aunt. I love sourcing the table. Now, one of the things that you might want to capture regarding supers in particular is getting the characters to define those secondary characters, the contacts, the coworkers, the love interests. Because we all know Superman wouldn't be Superman without Jimmy Olsen and Lois Lane. Absolutely. Now, finally... Uh, I want to say this is something universal for RPGs that I really try to focus on and some players struggle with. Don't roll for everything. Uh, There have been a number of times in my online games uh, where as as the DM, I, I encourage people to, you know, okay, give me the narrative. What's going on? What are you up to? Uh, And they will immediately after they finished saying something, go make a roll in their, in, in our dice channel. And, I have to stop them. I say, no, no, stop. Just, just wait. If there's something there, you're a superhero. Take that seriously. When you get to that level, there are certain things that just work. You can just do them. You're good at, they come naturally. If a character can lift a city bus, don't roll to knock down a door. If they can fly, they're probably not going to fall into that pit trap that the villain has set there before them. (laughs) Roll only when all of the outcomes are interesting. Sure, it might be funny to watch that arrogant speedster trip and fall on his face. But if they succeed the roll, do they just keep running? That's not interesting. This is a big one. This is is probably, um, along, along with sourcing the table and play to find out what's happening, the other biggest revolution that's come around in modern role playing that I'm sure some of the old guard knew as well but only rolling when both outcomes are interesting. Both success and failure have to lead to something interesting. The story has to change in an interesting way. It's a modern concept, but a very important one that has taken far too long for people to discover. And I got to say even longer for the majority to embrace. There are, I was looking at a Facebook argument today about what are the points of the skills in D&D? And the argument was everyone rolls for everything, but there's no need. Does it matter? Does it matter if they find the key? Then they find the damn key. Does it matter if they burst the door open? Well, yes, if the guards are going to come around the corner, but otherwise just let them open the door. And the old guard were so upset by this that that everything required a roll. Every roll should mean something interesting happens. And more importantly, the story should never get hung up on a failed roll. That's that's the D&D trope, the locked door that you never get to pick lock or you can't find the key from and you spend hours of just making the player re-roll and re-roll and re-roll. And yes, 3.5 D&D finally went, hey, we're going to throw in a rule called uh, roll 20 where you automatically roll a 20 on your die roll, but it takes 20 times as long. At least they put that in. But even then, if you're at the point where you're using the roll 20 roll, you probably shouldn't have had the roll there in the first place. Absolutely. Now, one other thing, uh, our chat room put up a really interesting question that I didn't cover here and I think is worth making sure we get to everyone. So, Pax says, as a complete novice, I'm interested to know whether there are particular Supers RPG that line up with particular comic creators, like Frank Miller style versus a Bruce Tim. And I would have to say no. While there are certain RPGs that lend themselves slightly in certain directions, I would find the tone of that, uh, that kind of tone is really more up to the GM. It's more important to find a system that you're comfortable running and that you feel you can run in that style of your favorite comic creator. There's so 
flexible or inflexible, depending on what you're looking for. Um, whether you're going with a, a D20 system where everything is very rigid and very cut and dry with rules, something like mutants and masterminds where you need your mathematics degree to make the character. But once you've made that character, things actually flow pretty smoothly because you've got hard lines for everything to find out or masks where almost nothing is well-defined and you're just freeforming throughout the whole thing. And, and you and the players are setting that tone, whether it be something a little more dark and, and, and uh, noir versus something as wild and crazy as some of the comic books that came out in the seventies. Uh, I, I would say there's definitely systems though, that are set to get different genres. If there were definitely games that are better at doing street level and games that are better at doing cosmic, I also think there's games that are better at doing Silver Age versus games doing modern. Uh, I mean, I'm not 100% sure that that's true. What I, what I will find is that there are certainly systems that are better at doing um, narrow versus wide. And, and, that's, and we've talked about this in the past, and we talked about this when I did my superhero uh, read-through reviews, where some systems don't handle the differences between right. different levels of heroes that's very well. Um, so you could do a street level or you could do a galactic level, but you couldn't have a national level and a street level in the same game because so the game usually allowed for that, which was the problem there. Like was. specifically, I've got the DC heroes role playing behind me, which was terrible for that. Like, like here you have Batman who has a two strength and Superman who has a 50 strength and that game, the stats are exponential to a three is twice as good as a two and a four is twice as good as a three. Well, Superman's a 50. And, and like, how do you represent that in the same group? Now you're looking at this game and it gives you all these characters to play and how to make your own. And when you're making your own, no, you can't quite make Superman, but you can get close. And I think they did that by design. You can't be faster than the flash. You can't be stronger than Superman, but then the module with it was the new teen Titans. And I was just like, there, there's a conflict here and what you're presenting me. And then what you're telling me to do with it. And that game worked great street level, but gave you the ability to, you know, fight Brainiac on your first game. And you're like, what are you doing with this? And I'm just thinking there's other games that would be like that. Fair. I guess, uh, again, I, I, to me still, I, I still find that finding that system that is comfortable for you and works with the way you want. Again, there are a lot of systems yes. out there. So if you want to play a tactical game, uh, we talked about some of the simpler ones that Dave uh, put out. Um, David Oakham. David Oakham put out, um, you know, which are a, for a tactical supers game on the easier side and, and lighter. Uh, or you can go into that heavy duty super crunch of a 5E or... I don't, or even don't more go. so the champions. <laughs> or, or, or champi champions or uh, mutants and masterminds. Uh, where everything is very clearly defined. Like that's one of the things about Mutant Masterminds. People are always hard on Eminem third ed. And because character creation in that system is painful, there's a lot of math and there's a lot of weirdness. But I have been told over and over and over again that because the character creation is so painful, that once you get past that, the game is actually really easy because you've gotten all that hard math out of the way and everything's right there in front of you to when you when you need to make a roll. Now, unfortunately, I still haven't gotten into a, a third ed m, m game and to, to prove that to myself. But I've seen enough comments that are repeatedly saying that from people I have some faith in that uh, believe that is so. So yeah, people again, have been telling me the same thing about GURPS for years. I still don't believe them. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I do have another question from the chat, um, which I guess we probably should have covered at the very beginning. But basically, what do you consider a supers game? Does it have to be, you know, Spider-Man, Superman, Avengers, DC, Marvel? Like, do games where players are playing as demigods count as supers? Uh, I and I'm assuming Ryan, Ryan, Red Meeple Ryan asked this. And I'm assuming he's not talking about the Asgardians because they are superheroes in the Marvel Absolutely. Game. Um, well, I mean, Hercules is a superhero in yeah, Marvel. Shazam, like, you know, yeah. you've got demigods or can definitely be supers. Uh, and I think a lot of it is where you're going with it. Um, 
Now, again, you get some systems which are a little different. Like we talked about uh, base raiders where you're dungeon delving as supers. Uh, mm -hmm. But for the most part, superheroes is about being heroes uh, who are just more than your average person. Now, maybe you're an Olympic athlete more than the average person, or maybe you can call down thunder and lightning more than the average person. Uh, but that's sort of a difference in kind. Um, and, and you're still using that ability, whatever it is, to help people and to be a hero. Um, and that's, I mean, you know, you, there's a whole lot of supers games where you could probably play firemen and paramedics and still that's be superheroes. That would actually tell them firemen. Yeah. Uh, there actually is one already. I'd yeah, have to oh, double I'm check. sure there is. Like, um, like, I, I, I don't think I backed it. I might have <laughs> afterwards, but there there is one out there that's basically there. There has to be. We we should, we should start calling it rule RPG. Uh, it's not rule thirty four, but it's the equivalent that, yeah. that if it exists, someone has made a role playing game. Yeah, pretty much. Like, I I am certain of this that somewhere someone has made a role playing game of it, whatever it happens to be. All right, um, that's all we got from the chat right now. So all right, well that's it for my tips for running a successful superheroes game. Well, thanks for that, Sean. Um, I hope that helps some people out uh, who are either in the chat room today or listening to this on the podcast or watching this on YouTube. Um, hope that helps out some potential supers GMs. And you also threw in some uh, player tips as well, which is awesome. All right, we're just going to pop into the lobby and see if there is anything else that uh, people want to say about this. So. All what right. you got for us, Lobby? So Pax says they want an Astro City style where you are civilian characters in a supers world. So you're the normals in a I, supers I, world. That definitely exists as it a definitely game. Definitely does exist. Um, what I don't know is I can't think of any supers games that I've read and owned, which again, my, my small selection's back there. That's Dwarf <laughs> Sean's. That, like, yes, there's rules for making people normal people, but like, like, who would want to like in those systems like the systems i own uh to be honest marvel heroic role-playing the the one that cam banks wrote would you could definitely do it because it's it's narrative it's yeah. it's very narrative based and you could be the the little old lady who lost her cat in the tree and make the hulk cry to turn him back into bruce Banner when he saves the kitty you know and it would work in mechanically but yeah it's it's one of those things where i Using most superhero systems, I would want an experienced GM who knew the system well enough so that they could make your character and the numbers would be right, right? Um, right. You Because you, you need I to... wonder if you just scaled everything up. Like, like scale the humans yeah, it's, so it's... their hero stats and then the heroes get superhero stats. That could certainly just to make it work in this. Yeah, system. again, it, you're, whether you're scaling up or scaling down, it's really kind of the same thing. But again, that's going to take your GM to understand the yeah. numbers of the system well enough to make that slide. Um, right. Whereas I think in some systems, um, and I, I, I don't want to be quoted on this one, but uh, mutants and masterminds again because of the power levels you can set up. If you just set a low enough power level um you know people wouldn't be able to buy powers they'd only be able to buy their stats uh and would essentially be humans um and then it's just a matter of you dealing with it uh one of was someone was saying uh superhero insurance uh yeah. interestingly in gurps supers i just that's read a comment to be a fantastic book to read I, i've been I, told I, that's an yeah. awesome source book i just saw someone today saying this needs to go into the rule book hall of fame in GURP yep. Supers, there is a calculation for how much property damage is done in a fight. So using something like that would mm -hmm. actually work in a civilian game because you could figure out how much damage that the Supers did to the apartment building nice. you live in or the, your home or where, you, where your office is. You know, you could be an insurance adjuster for Supers. Um, uh, damage control is another one that comes to mind, which is the Marvel uh, guys who go and clean up after superheroes. Yeah. Um, I, I actually, I'm a fan of the. Yeah, you know, damage. And, like, what are they, and the Wrecking Crew was part of that too, weren't they? Involved with that? Well, the Wrecking. Maybe they're um, the villains. The Wrecking Crew were villains. Yeah. Um, 
but the yeah, they it's... spawned from that. Uh, possibly, or maybe yeah. they, they're. Well, I know they ended up in connected. the MCU for a short bit with, uh, with one of the Spider-Man. Movies. Yeah, the Spider-Man movie had had uh, they they were actually talk. They were going to put out a damage control. I don't know if it was a series or a movie. It was in the works and it got I, kiboshed. I would, watch that. I would have watched it in a heartbeat, but it got kiboshed. I by... honestly think though, for for if you're gonna play normal people in the supers, you're probably better off just playing a modern RP, whatever what a D twenty modern, what whatever your popular modern thing is, and everything the supers do is story. Right. right? It, it it's all plot. It's it's what yeah. you're dealing with. I, I I think forcing a superhero system to do it might be difficult. Yeah, it depends. I mean, it sort of depends on where you want to go. You know, if you want to have someone try and be a hero during well, the game, yeah. uh, you know, if you if you want someone who gets sick of all the supers messing things up and throws on a costume and tries to be that vigilante, then then you might need that superheroes game. Uh, it's like sure. a lot of it again is depends on the long term direction. If you really are just running humans, then yeah, find a find your favorite. Actually, to be honest, it, we mentioned base raiders. Base raiders. By design, you could start with no powers, right? And raiding a base for the first time, and have the characters basically pick their powers during play, and that's how I planned to run it. It was I, I was planning on running it as almost a kids on bikes, so I wasn't thinking quite that young, but it was like you know young punks happened to stum stumble upon the, the the base of someone, and then have multiple options there for them. So there's right. the different power types that they can inject themselves with, or take the pills, or whatever. But that game specifically designed that there's a level up aspect, right? It's superpower right. dungeon crawling. So I think you could easily start a character. Now it's it's written in fate, but like the original goes back to spirit of the century level rules of fate, which are man way too crunchy for what's supposed to be a narrative game. Um, so character creation is a little rough in that one. So it's just a matter of adding. A, I can't even remember what they're called now. Talents or perks or whatever they're called during play. Uh, the other one is I have to say, um, Amazing Tales, uh, or in what I'm running, Amazing Amazing Heroes. Um, just don't give your characters any powers, and yeah. they get you know they're stuck with a D6 for personality and body, or maybe even they have a, a better personality. Uh, so your three basic stats there before powers are your job, your personality, and your body, mm -hmm. and so you don't give them any powers. And they've just got their their three basic stats at, at a D6 level or maybe, you know, personality can be higher because they've, they've just got a, a great personality that can really, you know, really charismatic or whatever. But there you go. I mean, it, it's again, it's a narrative game. There's nothing there's nothing else you need. Uh, yeah. It's about as simple as you can get. Um, and Amazing Tales is really just, uh, you know, amazing heroes without the supers. You know what's funny about this? This could have been a whole topic. We could have took that question. And made some recommendations for system. Because after you mentioned that, Savage Worlds. Savage Worlds would be perfect. Because the supers are just, I, again, I forget the term, perks, bonuses, whatever you call them, that you buy for your heroes. But you just don't give them any of them. Yeah, I don't Whereas really want to talk about how much money have. Savage Worlds has of mine right now because of what the Kickstarter they did on their own. Oh. <laughs> Savage <laughs> Worlds is a really solid system. But what Savage Worlds is good for is those humans who are fighting back. The, the two-fisted, right. pulpy... We're, we're going to be the heroes now, or we're going to help the heroes, or whatever, whatever the case is. Like, I can totally see a campaign starting where, like, Superman crashes into your neighborhood and, like, is dying, and you, like, tuck him away, and, and well, Superman's probably too high power, or whatever. Daredevil. You find Daredevil unconscious in an alley, and you kind of drag him and hide him, and while you're nursing him up to hell, you have to help solve whatever crime he was trying to do or something. And it's a totally different than the disaster survival godzilla meets you know type so, of thing. so interestingly if you're if you are interested in this topic i recommend going checking out powerless if you can find it somewhere so powerless was a 2017 uh nbc tv series set in the okay. dc universe about a company who was sort of dealing in a city with, with supers all around them but it was humans um and it was uh vanessa hugen uh, Hugh, uh hugen's and Danny Pudi were both uh, in it. And it was a fun show. Alan Tudyk was even actually part of it. Right. So if, it, it's got Alan Tudyk, so it can't be bad. Um, <laughs> it didn't last as long as it should have, but they kind of went a little... It's, it's got to be an Alan Tudyk thing. <laughs> um, you know, it, the I Boys. Think... The Boys is really yeah. a story of the humans in a superhero world. Yeah, no, absolutely. 
Um, it, it, and that's on the darker side. So if you want to go oh, into yes. that, much, if you want to go side. into that uh, that Zack Snyder direction, there you go. Uh, yes, power powerless. Me, I believe was from a graphic novel. The one right? I liked was was there was a Marvel one called Powers that was set at the beginning of the Marvel universe, where Submariner was the second most powerful Marvel character at the time. I don't know how. And um, Johnny Flame, whatever. I can, Human Torch was. And the two of them were fighting, but it's all told from the perspective of like dude driving to work, hearing about it on the radio, getting to work and everyone going, oh, it's bullshit. It's like War of the Worlds. And then, you know, the city getting destroyed in their first big clash. And like this goes like Golden Age Marvel, I guess those were their two big heroes before. Are you, are you know, sure that was Powers? Because Powers is a different one. They oh, did no, a Powers Sony was TV. really good. What was the Powers was the Sony, the Sony uh, sci-fi series they did where the, the detective had lost his powers. Um, I'm looking it up because I wish that here. series had continued on. That was a fantastic show. Um, See, this was a comic. That's why. Well, yeah, this one started it. off as a as a graphic novel, and then they no, turned it's it into a series. Called Powers. Oh, okay. Interesting. Brian Powers is a creator-owned comic book series written by Brian Michael Brendis. Oh yeah, okay, it is the same you... one. So they did a TV series of that. Oh, there you go. Um, yeah, 2015. They only did two series, two seasons. They canceled it before the third, and I was horrified because it was a fantastic show. Yeah. So, so yeah, I read the comic. Okay. Best ever hardcover. <laughs> I'm seeing lots of lots of results for this one. Uh, Ryan's so, asking honest, if the Avatar the universe would be a world of supers, I and I don't know because I know nothing about the Avatar universe. So sorry, I can't answer that one. I'd have to look at it. Uh, concealment nah. of identity is not important uh it is an aspect that can be made important and can yeah, be focused on totally but that's totally optional that's you can be your zero. tony you can be your tony stark and everyone in the world knows who you are um or you can be you know your clark kent who glasses are the magic superpower <laughs> i i would say the avatar universe could be a super setting there's no reason it couldn't be because only certain people have powers the powers are limited to the four elements, except the avatar who can use all four. I wouldn't want to play the avatar <laughs> in that game. Um, I know there is an avatar game out there that kickstarted and did really well, but yes, it can very much be a super powered thing. Cause it's, it is right. It's, it's ice powers or fire powers or wind powers or earth powers. And that's, what but, are, but are they, do. are they heroic? Like, are they, are they heroes or are they just, uh, the thing is, they call them benders, right? And they're just everywhere, right? So you'll go to a city that's mostly earth benders, and they're using it to, you know, ship their crops and stuff. But the characters are fighting against, in the original series, an evil empire. And the whole premise of the series is there's balances of four elements, but what happens when the Fire Kingdom attacks? And the Fire Kingdom decides they're going to take over the world. And the, you know, group of heroes who by the end come from all the different types of benders team up to defeat the Fire Emperor. Yeah, I, but I'm just thinking like the power use and everything definitely fits that. Yeah, it, it leans a little bit more into the fantasy it's tropes. More magic, of, yeah. Ma you know, fantasy tropes of, of it's more binding together to fight the invading enemy than yeah. fighting against the evil around us. Um, I guess that's that's sort of one thing that a, a lot of super actually, to be honest, Avatar is way more food that mm. happens to have special effects, right? Like Feng Shui might be a better game to run Avatar in. Yeah, because one of the things, and I, and we didn't talk about this, but I think it, it makes sense, is that a lot of the the evil that you're fighting, you know, in a in a fantasy game, you're fighting against the invading armies or the 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 big bad dungeon, uh, whereas on a lot of superhero concepts, you're fighting against the evil around you. It's it's sort of you know the bits and pieces of the world that are bad, but are all around you, uh, and it may be a certain super villain pops up here and there um and depending on you may be playing the galactic global stuff where there is a full you know invading army but for the most part you're going to be dealing with you know troubles troubles on uh, uh levels of you know even if it's a country thing where it's it's, it's not the full uh full-on uh invading armies and 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 uh menacing evil coming in from over the hill sort of concept so I was able to confirm it was in the 1940s the Human Torch fought the Submariner, but I can't find the modern book that was written about the people around that battle. And I found all kinds of articles about how the Fantastic Four Human Torch is not the original Marvel Human 
So I think we're gonna have to give up on that one. I have yeah. it downstairs. I just have to go <laughs> look at my shelf and be like, oh, that one. Submariner is is, is ridiculously powerful. I think they I think they nerfed him at some point. Yeah, I was gonna say he was he was, like a, he a, was a more badass Aquaman. That's uh, I, I seem to recall, and I believe Gale even actually had a whole thread about him at one point, uh, which is partially trolling because it's Gale, but <laughs> he was actually, you know, he was someone uh, significant. Uh, I'm still wondering what they're ever going to do if they get the get the Human Torch and uh, Captain America together in the same place. I, I, for some reason, I've just never seen them both at the same time. Not sure why. Uh, now we do have one comment from our Discord. Danielle yes. wrote. Uh, from our uh, Patreon Discord, super games rule just like most games, but even more with supers. If you don't have a really cool reason to deny, or a really good reason to deny a power, ability, or a cool action, don't. The superhero landing is always worth letting happen, or the seagull and pelican water cyclone, aka Gulnado. Gulnado has to, there, there's got to be a story there. But There's no, it, it's really there, true. It, like I talked about, I talked about uh, denying psychics, uh, and I think there's actually a really good reason for that. Uh, but again, you know, I, and I said it during the show. Stop! If someone says something, oh, I want to be invulnerable and, and immediately recover all my health, don't immediately say no. Think, oh, okay, maybe that is something. Uh, but all of a sudden, spandex is your weakness. You know, <laughs> it's. <Yeah. laughs> Uh, and here, uh, Danielle's talking in the chat room. Uh, she They played a character with the power to talk to birds and control over the wind. There you go. They were having a battle at sea. All right. Oh, so the, the uh, seagull and pelican water cyclone. Awesome. All right. I have already finished two coffees. That's probably not a good thing. So we are going to move on to the coffee break. And remember you got a game or game night question for either of us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or send an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Welcome to a look at the Quacks of Quedlinburg from North Star Games. Quacks of Quedlinburg was designed by Wolfgang Warsh, one of the hottest new designers in the board game world, who just kind of came out of nowhere in the last few years and has a number of hits under his belt already. It features artwork and design by Warsh himself, along with Dennis Bahausen. It was published in North America by North Star Games, and that's the copy I happen to own myself. Now, a copy of Quacks of Quedlinburg plays two to four players, taking under an hour for most games. This push your luck dice based dice based. Whoa. That. This push your luck bag builder has an MSRP of a very reasonable $39.99 US dollars. And this is the Bellhop's personal copy of the game. Nothing was provided. Now, the Quacks of Quedlinburg has racked up its fair share of accolades, including Origins Best Family Game, UK Games Expo People's Choice, the Meeple's Choice Award, the Golden Geek Best Family Game, and most important to hobby board gamers, the actual Kenner Spiel de Jar the year it came out, as well as many more. Now, this is one we've been seeing people play on streams and talking about for far too long before we got it to the table ourselves. I actually got to see it played in person even a number of times, but it was always at events where I was teaching something else, usually Terraforming Mars at around that time. One of the local gamers had a copy, and I just never got to sit in on it. Now, in a game of the Quacks of Quedlinburg, players take on the role of a quack doctor in a medieval setting, each competing to be the most successful charlatan. They do this by brewing up bubbly potions by adding ingredients to each their own individual pots, trying to get the thickest and most volatile mixture without going too far and causing their pot to explode. At the end of each round, players score points and get currency to spend to buy new ingredients, each of which does something different when added to your pot. Multiple recipe books are included, which provide four different mechanics for each of the variable ingredients, making it so you pretty much never have to play the exact same game twice. Now for a look at the components in this Push Your Luck Bag Builder, be sure to check out our Quacks of Quedlinburg unboxing video on YouTube. Just a few things I want to note here. Uh, the rules are excellent, very succinct, well-written, only eight pages, which is impressive. And they also provide you a nice QR code so you can watch fine Canadian Mr. Rodney Smith tell you how to play the game. 
Along with these rules, you also get what's called the almanac of ingredients. And this explains what each of the different variations of each ingredient does. These match the recipe cards, but feature a lot more detail. So you just have icons on the cards, full text on the book. Um, you also, there, there's a, a, a ton of punch boards in the box as well that give you all kinds of things. You got scoring tracks, player boards, flasks that are two-sided, fill or empty, the recipe cards themselves, and lots and lots of small ingredient chips. All of these were well cut, a pleasure to punch, no issues, nothing peeled. I didn't have any problems with them. Now, the game does have a serviceable two-trough insert that's covered in thematic artwork. In that, you're going to find four silky bags, uh, wooden player tokens for each, care, or each player, custom etched six-sided die that has unique symbols on it, a deck of fortune cards. Those, I, I, they're everywhere now. Those little plastic gems that are kind of misshapen that people use in all kinds of crafts uh, that remind me of Ascension whenever I see them, and a nice selection of baggies to organize all this stuff. Overall, the quality here is great. The artwork is fantastic, as is the graphic design. Mm -hmm. While there is a lot of iconography, all of it is very easy to understand and clear, and there's always the almanac of ingredients you can reference if there is something that isn't clear. Now, with that overview of what you get in the box, let's, box, let's talk about how you play the game with Quacks and Quedlinburg. All right, you start off with a couple decisions. One of them is to decide which side of the player board to use. Front side is just like normal game, your, your expected game. And then the second side actually has a bunch of potions on the bottom of it or vials with different colors on them. That's the more complicated rule. So I suggest starting off with the main side for your first few games. So the game has some great variation in it, like with these player boards. So you can really vary difficulty and increase your replayability. Very true. Next up, you have to decide what ingredients you'll use. Now, every ingredient is used every game, at least in the base game. Note, I have not played the expansion. We're just looking at the base game. Many of the ingredients feature four different variations to choose from, and each of these is represented by a rep uh, recipe tile. Well, technically, there's two, and they're two-sided. And you just look at the number of the bookmark on it to show which one it is. Now, what the game does recommend is start with all of the level one ones or all the ones with one bookmark, and I got to say I concur with this. This is one tricky aspect of the game as it's easy to get used to an ingredient doing one thing and perhaps even forget that you changed from last game what the infect effects of the ingredient are. Yeah, very true. If you're playing two games in a row, make sure everyone's well aware of what ingredients you are using. And if someone's joining your game who has played, say, oh, I played it once before, make sure they're aware of what ingredients are. Now, once you got these picked out, you're just going to collect your stuff, right? You're going to take your player board, put it on the right side. You're going to place your tokens in the respective spots in your flask. I'm not going to get into the details for this. You don't really need to know that. Everyone does start with one ruby, and you're going to put your thickness token. It looks like a little water drop right in the center of your pot in the first space. And note, that's T-H-I-C-K, not T-H-I-C-C. -C. Sorry if we got your hopes up. There's probably a game out there with a thick token, but that's not what we're talking about here. Now, players each take a bag, and you're going to fill it with starting ingredients. I'll get into what these all are later, but you're going to put in one white level one, two white level twos, one white level three, one orange, and one level one green. More about exactly what those do later. Now, all of the ingredient chits are then sorted and placed near their recipe cards. Now, most ingredients come in three levels, one, two, and four. And this indicates when you're pulling them and putting in your pot how many gaps you leave on your board which ends up meaning that higher level ingredients lead to higher scoring pots, potion pots. Now, this number can also change what the ability for the ingredients do, but that completely decides on which recipe you decide to use. Now, at the start of the game, you're going to pull the yellow and purple ingredients kind of off to the side because you can't purchase them. They're added later in the game. And that's really all there is to set up. Now, once you have everything set up, play simultaneous. Everyone plays at once. You're going to play over nine rounds. Now, at the start of every round, the active player, which passes at the end of every round, clockwise, is going to draw a card from the fortune teller deck and read it out, and you're going to act on what the cards say. Now, these cards are about 50-50 split on stuff that happens immediately or effects that stay in place and affect the round. Now, these encode all kinds of things I'm not going to give in detail to, like giving players a chance to increase the thickness of their pot or giving free ingredients or changing the odds pots will explode and so on. 
Now, luckily, you should know, uh, sorry, I haven't seen them by all by any means, but they are often quite welcome. Next, all players brew their potions. You do this by pulling chips out of your bag one at a time and adding them to your player board, starting with the spot next to your thickness token. The number on the chip indicates how far away from that token or the last ingredient you placed it goes. So like a level one chip just goes in the next empty spot, whereas a level two chip would skip over one and a level four would skip over three. Now, after placing the chip, you do the effects that chip has. Again, these are listed on the recipe cards. At any point, you can just choose to stop drawing chips. You indicate this by putting your bag on the table and saying you're done, and now you get to watch other people stress out over if they should be pulling or not. Now, stopping can be important because if you ever end up with a total number of white chips, cherry bombs, that their levels total seven, more than seven together, your pot explodes. Now, luckily, you should know exactly what's in your bag, so it's not too hard to figure out the odds with each pull from the bag. Especially at the beginning of the game. Once you get a pretty full bag, it does get more difficult. Now, at any point when drawing a chip, as long as your pot doesn't explode with that chip, you have the option to use your flask and return that chip to the bag. You just flip it over to the empty side, and you can't use it again until you refill it. So one redo, so long as you didn't blow things up. Now, once all players are done, they're all done brewing, they've either blown up or they put their bag down. Well, you probably put your bag down either way. You enter the evaluation phase. First, you figure out who has the thickest, most impressive brew that didn't explode. This player, or players if tied, get to roll the special D6 die and gets a benefit. Now, these include getting to thicken your pot, getting some points, getting a free pumpkin ingredient, or gaining a ruby. Now, a couple times now I mentioned thicken your pot. What that does is that water drop you place in the center starts spinning out. It starts moving away from the middle, which leads to starting the game or starting the round further up on the track for all future rounds. And since the goal, of course, is to get the furthest on your track, the thickest potion, the further along you start, the less pulls you need and the better your odds. Exactly. Next, you're going to look and see if anyone has any black ingredients in their pot and resolve them, then green, then resolve them, and purple, then resolve. Again, you're going to use the recipe cards as a reference. Now, this could lead to players moving things in their pots, scoring points, or getting to thicken their pots based on which ingredients you have in play. Next, you're going to look at the spot just after your last ingredient, so the, the first empty spot. And if it shows a ruby, you get a ruby. You also then get the points that are shown on that spot, which is tracked on the scoreboard. Then there's one other number on there. That's the amount of gold coins you earn selling your potion that round. You then use that to spend on ingredients. You can buy one or two ingredients, but they have to be different types. Now, the cost of each ingredients on the recipe cards, and one thing that's important is gold does not carry over. There's nothing you actually have to track here. So if you don't spend all your gold right now, it's lost. And now that's if you didn't explode your pot. But this game is quite friendly. So even if your pot blew up, you're not completely out of luck. Right. So if your pot explodes, you did have to stop. So you're stuck wherever you just ended. You're not eligible for that bonus die, but you still get to either score points or go shopping. And honestly, it's really not that bad. It's not that harsh because early in the game, there's very little points. Like you have to go pretty thick before you get into a lot of points. So you're probably just going to be like, I don't need the points. I'm going to go shopping. Whereas later in the game, you've probably got plenty of chips in your bag. And you know what? Getting those points might be worth it. Now, finally, the last thing you do at the end of every round is players have the option to spend two rubies, if they have them, to either thicken their pot, as we talked about before, or flip their fat flask back to the full side, assuming they've used it. Now, there are some variations that happen while you're playing. Starting with the second round, the rat tails come into play. This is a catch-up mechanic where every player compares their spot on the score track to the leader and counts up how many rat tails are shown in graphics on the board um, that they have, and then they have the option to add these tails to their pot to artificially thicken them. This is represented by placing the rat token on your board a number of spaces ahead your thickness token equal to the number of tails. Now, the rules say this is optional, but I still have not seen any reason why you wouldn't use your rat tails every round. So, interestingly, there is a certain group of people who don't like this mechanic. I ran across this while I was researching something in the game at some point, and I was personally confused by it, but some people are competitive enough to not enjoy catch-up mechanics. 
personally, I find that why is someone who's that competitive playing such a random game as this? Like you're playing Quacks of Quedlinburg, it's kind of a silly game where potions explode and you're throwing interesting things in a pot. But fair, as some people don't want to use the rat mechanic, it's a really simple one to skip. I don't think it would ruin the game, so I wouldn't want to be that player and last the whole game. Now, during rounds two and three, new ingredients get added. Remember I said you put some aside? Well, in round two, the yellow comes back, and in round three, the purple comes back. Additionally, when you hit round six, the game gets a little more difficult because everyone has to add one more level one white token to the bet. Now, while most of the game is played, everyone playing at their own speed simultaneously, when you do get to the last round, that changes. This is still played simultaneously, but everyone draws just one chip, deals with it, then waits till everyone's done, then draws another chip and deals with it. To pass this time instead, when you're pulling your chips out of your bag, you reveal an empty hand, and that means you're done for the round. As in the normal game, while you are playing, you're supposed to be focused on your own pot, and the game strongly discourages you from looking at other players' pots to make your decision. You're just supposed to be focused on your pot. But that final round, like knowing how many black ingredients a player has or how much gold they're going to collect, or if you're in the lead for thickness, is an important part of the decision in the final round of the game. So it is played time-based in that last round. Uh, interestingly, everything in this game is simultaneous, yeah. uh, even uh, even re uh, resolving cards. The only time that things are not simultaneous is if player order will affect something. So if you're about to run out of rubies, yes. you have to take player order into account. But otherwise, everything throughout the game is simultaneously. Yes. Now, now in... Yeah, sorry. Honestly, what, most of the time, though, especially during those first rounds, you're so focused on remembering what's in your bag and thinking about the odds and counts of what's in your bag and what you might be pulling next. The, 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 the thought of looking at someone else's pot, it just isn't there. And plus, once you've passed, right, you're not allowed to pick your bag back up. So at that point, feel free to watch what other people are doing and see how much it's either ruining your plans or how you're still in the lead. Now, the final evaluation phase, it's in the ninth round. Instead of buying ingredients, because there's no point, right? You're done playing. Your purchase power is then converted to points. Five purchase power to one point. And you also sell all your rubies, because there's no reason to thicken your pot or anything at this point. And those are two to one. So you spend two rubies to get one. At the end of that, player with the most points wins. Now, what I didn't talk about at all at this point is what all these ingredients are and what they do. So there are a total of eight ingredients most of which have four different powers. So here's a quick list of what each of them do with at least one ability they have. So I'm going to start with orange, which is representative of pumpkins. They don't do anything. They fill your pots and they're cheap. You can only buy level one pumpkin. Next, one of my favorites is the blue, which is the crow skull. These include abilities that let you draw bonus ingredients and pick one to place and put the rest back in. Or there's ones that give you rubies if you place them on a, on a spot that shows a ruby on it. They do some really neat things. Next are red, which are toadstools. We tend to call them mushrooms. They're close enough. Uh, they've got some neat ones that involve the pumpkins, like skip spots based on how many pumpkins are already in the pot. Or combining with the white chips to make them more potent. So the more white chips you have, the better your reds are. Yellow is the mandrake. Their most powerful ability to me is the level one ability, which is to give you a chance to return white chips to your bag. But they can also increase your explosion threshold with a different recipe. Now, blacks represent African death head hawk moon moths. Um, this is an ability set by the number of players. So yes, there are two sides to this, but it's based on how many people are playing the game. And what this does is rewards the player who has the most black chips in their pot at the end of the round. They're going to earn rubies or get the chance to increase the thickness of their pots. And this one only comes in one level. You buy blacks. You can't buy level two or three, two or four blacks. Next are green, which are the garden spiders. They tend to reward you for being the last or second last ingredient in your pot, or perhaps letting you thicken your pot by spending rubies when placed. Now, purple is ghost breath. You get rewarded for having one, two, or three of them in your pot, or rewarding points for where in your pot they are. How thick was your pot before you added them, which I thought was a really fun one. Then finally, we have the whites, the cherry bombs. So these are the chips that make your pot explode. And I don't know if you remember from the beginning, it's also what you start with the most of. And yes, I know they don't look like cherries, but that's because this is a German game. And the picture is of the German snowberry or Nollerbsen, 
which is also the German word for bang snap. So what you have here is a really clever German pun that just didn't translate well. But if you want to, you can call them bang snaps. I think it fits a little better. I won't tell anyone. I don't know why they didn't just call them snowberries. Uh, too much Google is spent annually by players who buy this game and try to figure out this yeah. very issue. At some point, everyone who owns this game, if they haven't heard it already, is like, what are the, why are these white? Why are they called cherry bombs? Now, I did mention earlier, there's a second side to the player board. If you're using that, at the bottom, there's all these vials. You put a second thickness token down there, a liquid token down there. And every time you get to thicken your pot, you get a choice. Thicken your main pot or move this token to the right going across the various vials. And each of them shows some kind of reward. They do things like giving you free uh, ingredients or giving you points or rubies. Now that we know what you get and how to use it all, let's move on to our opinion of this game. Does Quacks of Quedlinburg live up to the hype? And who should be looking to pick this game up? Yeah, speaking of, this game had a lot of hype. A ton of hype since it was first published. This game was so popular that it, it did the wingspan thing. It did the, everyone's talking about it. It's out of print. No one can get it. People are paying ridiculous price on the secondary market. And it comes back in print. And everyone's been waiting for it and pre-orders it. And it goes out of print again. And then it comes back in print. And I honestly think right now it might be between print things. That's how popular this game is. There were times when you just couldn't get this game anywhere. And that's one of the main reasons it took me so long to actually get a copy myself, which my mom managed to track down and give me for my birthday this year. And I don't even know where she found it because I think she might have got it on some one, you know, on online game store and paid shipping to get it here. So thanks, mom. Now that I played the game multiple times, like I, at least three game nights where we played multiple times in a row, this is a great game. I, I will straight up say yes. The Quacks of Quedlinburg lives up to the hype. All of the hype I've read. Even right now, you can still find it on eBay for $150 in a new un yeah, un unopened it's box. It's between printings again. Do not pay $150 for this game. It's good. Just wait for the next printing. Now, it was one of those games that everyone had talked about it so much. You started to question if it could yep. really be that good. Or maybe it was only for a certain group or a very narrow type of player. But no, it's really good. Oh, it is. It, it is really damn good. But I will say it's not perfect. I do have some minor complaints. Like my biggest minor complaint is still pretty minor. And that's the bag and the chips and how the two integrate. Like at first you see it and you're like, oh, these tokens are nice and thick. And I, I can't tell them apart at all, which is important, right? I, I can't tell them apart. And it's a nice silky bag. My hand fits in it good. It's a decent sized bag. But then once you actually start to use it, this bag wants to be flat. And it, it's a flat style bag that's stitched on the edge and it has corners. And it's just not as easy as it should be to not get the chits to just like line up in a row in the bottom and you shake it up and they don't really feel like they're moving around enough. And like really to mix it up, you kind of have to get in there and do this, which I, I just want to shake the bag. Plus stuff gets stuck in the corners all the time. Like there's always at least one chip stuck in a corner that you totally didn't realize was in your bag. You go to clean up the game and you're like, oh, there's one more in here. Yeah, this is hands down my biggest complaint, and not just mine, it's probably the biggest complaint you find on the on the, yeah. the web about this game. And it's a very specific combination of bag and cardboard that caused the problem. Yeah. If the bag was a rounded bottom without corners, this would be a moot point. Yeah. If the tokens were notably thicker, or better yet, the nice wooden pieces you can buy as upgrades, this wouldn't be an issue. But as it stands right out of the box, it is, unfortunately, less than ideal. Yep, totally agree. Now, the other issue that I don't have with the game, but other players have raised while playing this game, and I kind of alluded to this earlier, is the very high random factor. While it's possible and encouraged for players to completely memorize what's in their bags and potentially what's in their opponent's bags and figure out the exact odds of pulling a specific tile and the exact odds of exploding by pulling the next tile, there's always a chance things don't play to the odds. There might be a 99% chance. Well, there's still that 1% chance. You're, well, I don't think the odds, your bag never gets full enough to be a 99% chance. This can be very frustrating for highly strategic players. Players who want to win or lose a board game based on their own abilities and not the vagaries of a bag pull. Now, attached to this, there is some additional randomness too with the bonus die and the fortune cards. If someone keeps rolling rubies or thicken their pot on that bonus die, that gives them a significant advantage. 
And some of the fortune cards do favor one player over another. As someone who plays a lot of random games, this is one I find that works. It's mm -hmm. not like if you reduce the randomness, you'd have a solid, thinky game. Randomness is an integral part of the game. Yeah, it, 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 by design, it's a push your luck game. That's the 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 whole point of the game is how many can I pull before it pull, blows up? Do I make the pull or do I not? Now there are some ways to mitigate this randomness a bit. Uh, tactical use of your flask, knowing when to use it, purchasing ingredients that do things to change the odds, right? To increase your explosion limit or put tokens back in your bag or select, draw a bunch of tokens and pick one are all going to help with that randomness. But you know what? Even with all of those in play, if you try to make it as little random as possible, it's still a push your luck game. And while it does feature some solid strategic elements, like what you buy, you can definitely go different strategies and you can plan ahead as far as what you're going to buy in the next games. And yes, it has a very Euro style system. It's a most points win game, but luck plays a big part of the Quaxiquen Limit. The push your luck just can't be completely ignored as a root mechanic of the yeah. game. Now, of course, some people are going to love this about Quacks. So, personally, I really enjoy it. I think that balance is perfect in this game. I love that point where you're like, you know the odds, and it's, you know, better than 50%. You're like, oh, I have a 60% chance to pull or not to pull, but I know that if I pull and I blow up, I'm not going to get to what are the next ruby. Or I want to buy this card that costs 12 and I'm sitting on 11. All of those factors and you're like, Ugh! and you look at it and you either, you know, yell out and yes, I got it. Or damn, I, I love that. And it can feel very rewarding when it works. And it can be very frustrating when it doesn't. But usually that frustration is more of an amusing moment. It's like, oh, I knew I pushed my luck. It's my fault. No one else made me do it unless you're doing an extra live stream. <laughs> um, I blew myself up. I'm, I'm the one that made the mistake. Yeah, and indeed, while the good game could have been punishing and left players hanging for that one step too far, it's just not. Yeah. And you stay in the game longer than you might expect, even making poor decisions. Yeah, it's one of those, that's another thing that people take into consideration. If you're the point leader, you can probably push your luck a little more than everyone else. And I have seen people get overconfident because they have a solid lead only to lose it. Now, moving more to the positive side, one of the best aspects of this game is the fact you aren't punished too severely. Your pot explode is not the end of the world. And that's what I expected when I read the rules and when I saw other people playing this game is it seemed horrible. Like, my pot exploded, I get nothing. But it's not. While you may lose out on a bonus die roll, you then pick, do I want points or do I want purchasing? Another aspect that comes into play here, too, is that rat tail catch-up mechanic. I think this is really well done. I, I Kind of surprised that people don't like this. All players but the leader get to thicken their pots at the start of each round. The only part of this that doesn't make sense is the fact that in the rules make this optional. Like, I, I, I guess it's optional for the people. They must have had play testers who were like, we don't like this. So, yeah, again, some people hate this mechanic. And there are some really almost bizarre discussions about it out there to be read. I'll, I'll, leave, I'll let you find, do that Googling <laughs> on your own. Yeah, you can discover that on your own. Uh, everything else about the game I love or like. Um, rules are clear. It is really easy to teach. That is one, one aspect of this. Is the mechanics are tied very well into the theme. And it just the idea of thickening potions and everything just makes sense, right? So when I'm teaching this game, I always talk about it. I'm like, you want to add cherry bombs because they make your pot bubble which gets people's attention, right? You're going to get more points for a big bubbly pot. But you don't want it bubbling too much, it explodes. Or you know what? You can add rat tails to make your potion thicker. Like saying that just makes sense. And, and I find that people remember the rules for this game better than many other games I own. And people who even haven't played it for months remember this just because the theme is so well tied to those mechanics. Yeah, absolutely. It's pretty hard to imagine not getting the basics down, even for someone completely new to the hobby gaming, quite quickly. Now, player boards are well-designed. Iconography here on the scoring track and the recipes all make sense. I honestly don't think I had to reference the rule book after our first game was done. Like, I don't think I've ever had to go back to it to check anything. Now, I will admit, we do use the almanac liberally to make sure we're getting the ingredients right. Now, the fact that many of the ingredients feature four different versions is another aspect I love about this game. 
what ingredients you use actually changes the feel of the game. Some are going to make thicker pots. Some are going to give you more randomness and some are going to be less. If you want less randomness, here's a tip for you. Use the blue ingredient, the crow's head that lets you pull multiple ingredients from your bag and put it back. Combine that with the red token that lets you save up chips between rounds and throw in the mandrake, the yellow, that gives you a chance to put back cherry bombs and you've just reduced the randomness of this game by a huge factor. Yeah, of course, learning all these combos and mitigations is where the strategy and gameplay comes in outside the luck. Yes. So this is something you're deciding as a group for what ingredients to use. So it's not like you can you can take advantage of it, but yes, noticing those combos is a big part of the strategy in this game. Another thing I do appreciate is the simultaneous play. I always love a game where you're invested all the time. While there can be some downtime if you finish pulling first or you blow up, most of the time everyone's playing inactive. And even if you're eliminated in this game, it's fun to watch other people antagonize over their pulls. Which leads me to another benefit of this game and its ability to draw a crowd. Now, this isn't going to matter for those of you who play at home with your regular group, but the pusher luck nature of this game tends to get people excited and standing up and exclamations of joy and cries of frustration. This is a great public play event. We recently had a podcast episode where we talked about organizing public play events. One of the things you want to do is have something that will draw in people passing by or people not necessarily people playing other games but like people who are like oh what's going on over there right you want to do it quacks will do that for you fair warning though if there's people next to you playing an 18xx game they may not like you very much you know one of the first streams we ever rated as a channel was a play of quacks again just indicating just how intriguing this game is out on the table so i, I think it's pretty obvious overall i dig this game a lot i think we both dig this game a lot um, well, I do have some very minor complaints, the bags and chips and the combination of both, um, and the push your luck thing may not be for everyone. This is a fantastic game. This is honestly one of the best games I played this year, with my only real regret being that it took till 2021 to be able to actually play this game. If you dig push your luck games, rush out and pick this up. Like, like you don't you don't need to play before you, you buy. As soon as you can, grab this game. Like, this is one of the best pusher luck games I've ever played. It has replaced, it is now my top pusher luck game, and it has displaced Dead Man Tell No ah, Dead Man Tell No Tales has fallen down below because this is just such a great pusher luck. Now, if you're into themes, if you're more about the themes of the games, if you like the theme of quack doctors brewing up snake oil, or dig games that tie that theme heavy to the mechanics. So there's a, a good binding of two. And don't mind a bit of luck being involved. You should also check this game out. Now, people who want a loud, raucous game that's a step above a party game, but still plays in under an hour, this could be perfect. I know we have had some great times combining this with some craft beers and New Year's parties, though the player count of only four players does mean it's not a perfect party game. Now, we don't have it, so we can't comment in detail, but the expansion does allow for a fifth player. There you go. Now, if you are a gamer who likes to be totally in control of your own destiny and dig games with perfect information where you can plan multiple turns ahead, Classic Quedlinburg is probably not for you. Oh, you never know. It might win you over. Now, I am guessing the majority of you listening or watching right now fall somewhere in the middle here. For you, I strongly recommend get, finding a way to try this game. Find a way to play before you buy or play a friend's copy, ask the local game store if they have a demo copy, try it out at a con. This game is designed so well, is so easy to teach, and can be so much fun. Just like literal visceral fun of, do I blow up or not? It's going to appeal to a broader range of gamers than just people who like Push Your Luck. That's it for our review of Quacks of Quedlinburg. I invite you to check out Mo's written review of this expansion over on the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. So as I mentioned at the top of the episode, I've been having a rough week. Um, it's due to an injury that I'm having to get treated daily at the local health integration network, an injury that has me spending most of the day on the couch, as sitting for any period of time can be a problem. So due to this, I haven't had a chance to play any, like, like not physical. And that's all right, because we've got Board Game Arena. 
And we haven't actually talked much about online plays lately, so why not today? Indeed, we play a lot of online board games. Now, before we get into the games we played, I do want to share a discovery Sean made that has made playing on Board Game Arena so much better for both of us. And that's the fact that if you open up two different windows on the same game, both update real time. What this means is that if you have two or more monitors, you can have each showing a different part of the same game. Now, I have to say, BGA point tweeted out a post about some tips, and most were pretty obvious to us who've been using it for a long time. But this one wasn't even clear what they meant, as the language they yes. used was really confusing. They kept It kept sounding like they were expecting you to put in a command. I agree. But once you figure out that they just mean open multiple browser windows, it's a game changer. And I have confirmed you can even open it in two different browsers. Because I tend to run with two different ones. Now, the main thing both of us have been playing is plenty of patchwork, the Uwe Rosenberg two-player only game about making patchwork quilts. Uh, the more I play this on BGA, the more I love the interface. Uh, I would actually say at this point, it surpasses the app version of the game, which I paid good money for. This is a game that was greatly improved by the two monitor trick, as far as I'm concerned, because now I can see my board and the score payment track on my main monitor and have Sean's board up on the other one so I can hate draft or whatever. Though I have to admit, I'm, I'm not at that level yet. Most of the time, I don't really pay attention. Sean's kind of on his board. But now and then, I can be like, oh, he can't fit that. So I'm going to make sure that this scrolls here. And while I'm still not good at the game, losing <laughs> to Mo is nearly as painful as being utterly trounced yes. by the AI in that paid version. So we, we've now played enough games. I should challenge the AI one more just to see if mm -hmm. I do any better. Mm -hmm. But yes, I, I tend to, like, how do you get scores in the 30s in <laughs> Patchwork? I think I did it once. I think I got a 32. So yeah, Patchwork, really well done. Um, I think we confirmed this already that it's free to play. You don't need to sub. So anyone can go play that. You just need to make an account on Board Game Arena. Next up, we've got Clans of Caledonia which I think we started right after the last Sunday brunch, because Deanna mentioned we should start up a new game of it, so I did. Um, we finished that game, and now we're on to our second game. And man, was that last one close. Like, I took it for, by five points, despite making a terrible mistake in the long round. Last round, where I killed off the wrong cow for beef, and I lost the territory bonus to D, but I still managed to steal it, so that's a good one. Um, this is another amazing board game arena implementation. Like, the, the only part I still haven't figured out is how you can tell the commodity scoring because there's a whole thing when you press certain spots on the board, you get honor bonuses. And I, I remember we figured it out once, but I still don't know. Like I'm thinking I'm going to go get my game and put the board out so I can at least track where these things are. Cause I don't even see how much everyone shipped until I get the final scoring up in front of me. And I'm like, Oh, okay. That's the only thing that's not clear on BGA. Everything else though is fantastic. Yeah, so in the victories point scoring, aside from the your current total, are all hidden in mouseovers. Yeah. So I made a mistake in how my clan brewed beer in the first, in like the first two rounds of that of that game, and that's why I was out of the running pretty much right on. But even that being said, I still felt it finished pretty strongly once I did realize that I'd been horribly messing up my my clan's <laughs> main power. I know your score was still pretty close to ours. I don't. I, I think you're only about 15 behind. Next, we have an ongoing game of Zolkin with our friend Eugene, but he keeps forgetting that it exists. He keeps forgetting that Board Game Arena exists. And while well, it's been over a week now for him to take his turn. So I know he's got a lot going on. Um, he just left the nursing field and is looking for other work. Uh, if you are looking for a voice actor, I can hook you up. Um, but I did send him a reminder today to take his turn, and he did reply with an expletive, meaning he at least got the message, and the word sorry, because, you know, he is Canadian. So I haven't checked it now. Maybe he's finally taking his turn. Yeah, Zolkin, which we learned about the online uh, implementation during BGA, during our Extra mm -hmm. live stream, is a really solid implementation, with one minor exception. That's if they aren't 100% consistent with how they reference the different wheels. Now, if they would fix that, I think that game would be near perfect online. Yeah, and then having played multiple times with the physical copy, it's a great implementation. 
I'm not having the problem with the wheels because I, I, my, my frame of reference is still my nice board with the nice gears that turn on it. Finally, we do have a game of Castles of Burgundy that we mentioned last week. We haven't quite finished. We're really close. Like I could probably might even be able to go finish it right now if other players have taken turns. I wasn't sure about this after after at first. Like like I I'm like I, I don't know. It, it's kind of ugly. I can't quite tell things apart, and I'm not sure on this. But then I sat down and played the physical game, and now coming back to it, having played the physical game, I love it. It's pretty much perfect. It's honestly better than the physical version in a number of ways because of our tooltips for all the tiles and all the handling of fiddly chips between rounds is all done by the computer, including remembering to swap between tile types in three-player games. The scoring iconography is still terrible and only now makes sense to me having played in person. And I'm sure Sean is still completely lost. Honestly, having never read a rule or looked at a video on this game, I'm kind of shocked that I'm not that far behind you two. Uh, now, I noticed, I mean, the gap is spreading, so it, it's definitely uh, a significantly bigger gap. I mean, because at one point in the early rounds, I was ahead, but I think that was just because I wasn't planning for the future, and you guys were. Um, I think my biggest mistake early on was not understanding workers, because right. I think I wasted some dice that could have been better used uh, elsewhere with that. Uh, and then once I heard you talking about that, I'm like, oh, well, that makes oh, a whole lot of point. sense. <laughs> yeah, like it's a Steffenfeld game, right? It's a point salad and it is dice based. But like this game has more dice mitigation than most. Like, like the numbers on your dice are kind of guidelines <laughs> with the workers and the buildings that can give you more workers and the things that can make workers shift things one or two. Yeah, that game should wrap up, and then I, then I don't know. Maybe we'll we'll do a video call, and I can or a text. We'll open up Jitsi, and I can explain some of the more opaque parts. Well, I mean, they I'm even, probably like, just going to watch. What's even dumber is they've got a thing that references all the different scoring things, but like even on Board Game Arena, you have to turn them. I don't like if you look at it. It's like it only shows some of them. And there's an up arrow. I'm like, why couldn't you just show all of them? Yeah, I'll probably I'll probably watch a Paul video. I think Paul's done a video of it. I don't even know. I, I i'm sure like <laughs> that's a classic film yeah. i don't know if it's part of the new kickstarter are they reprinting uh castles of burgundy as part no, of the it's all the city. City it's only just the cities it's uh oh castles of burgundy burgundy's a, i don't know they're redoing Bruges. they're doing marrakesh i don't know Bruges, marrakesh i want to say new york or manhattan or new york or something new york well they're redoing new york and then there's one other city I which is new york was. cable car I don't know. There's the, well, there were three in the original Kickstarter, and I think there's three in this new one. So there's six so far. I think they're doing a total of eight. I'm pretty sure. No, pretty, pretty sure it's four in this Kickstarter. Four. So maybe it was four in the first one. Yeah, because it was four for a ridiculous amount of money. Well, yes. so how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? Honestly, the, the next week, nothing. Like, like, uh, we'll be here to do our show. I don't know if um I'll be able to do the Sunday brunch. I honestly have sat here longer than I should have just doing this um to be honest if we didn't have a sponsor for tonight's episode we probably would have canceled tonight um so gaming wise uh probably some board game arena stuff i have no clue if i'm gonna play a game at a table i also know tori and kat are uh, heading out to a wedding on friday so they wouldn't be coming over this weekend anyway but i'm thinking i i, I with what i am going through they're still saying another two to three weeks so we'll see i'll do what i can uh, and for record, it's Hamburg, Amsterdam, New York, and Marrakesh. I don't know what games those are repeating. That's the problem. Like, I know one of them's Macau. I know one of them's Bruges. But like, they renamed him. Like, like he he's revisiting his classic games, supposedly improving them and redesigning them, and then re-releasing them as these deluxe. Like, even the non-deluxe edition are deluxe compared to the originals. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, absolutely. Felt games are generally kind of ugly. And Queen Games is good at production. One thing, I, they may not be great at running Kickstarters, but they make some nice-looking games with some great iconography. Like, think of Brew, or Castles of Burgundy if designed by the guy that did, um, oh, Bastille. Right? That game has such clear iconography. Right. Yeah, I don't know. Probably digital games. That's probably what will happen. I haven't even, like, I'm not even playing video games. Like, veg and watch Netflix, because I have to be in, like, a certain link. Kind of sucks. Um, yeah, just to say, so wooden wooden components and game trays, official game trays with a Z inserts on all of these. 
So yeah, and that's not the deluxe, right? That's the that's the basic, yeah, yeah, the basic version. Like I said, even the basic versions, they're they're heirloom games. Uh, people who can afford them and who like Feld will probably pick them up. I'm just gonna keep pushing Queen to send us review copies because we're Stefan Feld's biggest fans. Except when he dresses up as an Arab. Yeah. All right, moving on. <laughs> now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests. Our Patreon backers, we greatly appreciate their support. Donna, who we keep calling Pax in the chat, who already had to take off, but thank you, Donna. Courtney Jackson, once Mo, uh, Mo recovers, we're going to have to plan another online game session. Yeah, it's been too long. Matt Lichtenwaller, thank you, Matt. Roger Malosh, thanks as always, Roger. Zopi, thank you. Well, that was the double bell. That means our shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to bring out the kryptonite and shut our powers down. Though the doors to the lobby are closed and we're slowly growing weaker, you can always find us all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com, find our podcast on your podcatcher of choice, and sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below. Now, if you like the content we're providing and want to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping your bellhops at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. And before we go, one more quick shout out to our sponsor, Crowd Games. Be sure to check out City of the Great Machine on Kickstarter. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For the lobbyists, thanks for joining us and be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show and stop by Sundays for brunch when we're able to have them. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.